This presentation will focus on some items in Matthew chapter 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and then John 20 and 21. I would encourage you to read those so you know the details behind some of the things we'll be discussing. So with that in mind, let's take a look at Joseph Smith, Matthew 28, 2, Joseph Smith Translation, Mark 16, 3, Joseph Smith Translation, Luke 24, 2, and Joseph Smith Translation of John 20, verse 1. And what we're going to see here is the law of witnesses being displayed. First of all, Joseph Smith, Matthew 28, 2 says, and behold, there was a great earthquake for two angels, Joseph Smith added that, of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Joseph Smith's translation of Mark 3 says, But when they looked and they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great, and two angels sitting thereon, clothed in long white garments, and they were affrighted. Joseph Smith's translation of Luke 24, 2 says, And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and two angels standing by it in shining garments. And then in John chap or Joseph Smith's translation of John chapter 20, verse 1, it says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene, early when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre, and two angels sitting thereon. I bring this up to show you that Joseph makes sure that each account of Christ's resurrection, that there were two angels. He adds those in there. Most of them, or all of them, just says one, but they were two angels. Well, we learn in Doctrine and Covenants, section 6, verse 28, And now, behold, I say unto you, and also unto my servant Joseph, the keys of this gift, and I believe what he's referring to is a gift translation at this particular time, which shall bring to light this ministry, and in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. So that is the law of witnesses. In the mouth of two or three witnesses is God's word established. And we see that being played out here in the description of the witnesses of Christ's resurrection. And so, that's how we can know the true doctrine of the church and the truth is that doctrine and the truth will always be given in the mouth of two or three witnesses where his word will be established. Let's go to Matthew chapter 28, 11 through 15. The sure sign of Christ's divinity. Verse 11. Now, when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done, that the tomb is empty and that uh, the stone is rolled away. And so they tell the chief priests of the Jewish leaders that the body is gone. Verse 12, And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers. Verse 13, Saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And so here they are bribing them with money to say that someone has taken the body of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, And if this come to the governor's ear, we will persuade him and secure you. 
meaning that you could punishable by death if a guard falls asleep while on duty and something happens while he's asleep. And they're saying, go ahead and say you're asleep. Someone has stole the body and we'll take care of the problem, the issue with the governor. We will persuade him and you will not be punished. It's interesting that the chief leaders here of the Sadducees and Pharisees are going to great lengths to hide that the resurrection has truly happened. Verse 15, so they took the money and did as they were taught. In this saying is commonly reported among the Jews unto this day. So why would the Jewish leaders of the Sanhedrin go to such great lengths to have people bear false witness and to bribe them? Well, the resurrection as the sign of Joseph was the ultimate proof of the Savior's divinity. Only a God could perform such a miracle. The Jewish leader's behavior to go to such great lengths to cover it up seems to suggest that they know how damning this is to them and their rebellion against the Savior. His resurrection is a sure sign of his godhood. And they know that. And instead of humbling their hearts, repenting, and turning unto Christ, they now try to cover it up as if someone has stole it because they know that this goes to great lengths to convict them. And that this shows that he truly was the Son of God. But it shows you how hard-hearted they were. They couldn't even accept that. Mark 16, verses 9 through 13, and Luke 24, 36 through 41, gives us some great insight that Thomas was not the only one who would not believe Christ was resurrected until he could see him and touch him. We need to stop this in the church of this saying we have of doubting Thomas. Thomas was not the only one that made that claim, but he's the one that gets this bad press as, oh, doubting Thomas. He was the only one who wouldn't believe unless he saw the Lord. No, we're going to find out that all of them did not believe the resurrection. In Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 13, it says, Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with them as they mourned and wept. So she goes and tells the apostles and the other disciples. And they, when they heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. You see, even they didn't believe, all of them. And after that, he appeared in another form unto two of them. And they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue. Neither believed they them. So they didn't believe Mary Magdalene, and they didn't believe the two who Christ appeared unto. So Thomas gets a bad rap. He is only saying what the rest have said. We don't believe it. Now, here is probably why. In Luke 24, 36-41, it says, and as they thus spake, Jesus stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. See, we need to remember, this is the first time this has ever happened in the history of mankind. No one has ever been resurrected from the dead. Verse 38, And he, Christ, said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? 39, Behold my hands, my feet, 
that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And when they had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And now listen to this. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? They yet believed not for joy. He's even in the midst of them, and they're still struggling with the reality that he is alive three days after they witnessed his death. It was just too good to be true. They yet believed not for joy. See, all of the twelve, or the eleven, Judas is not among them, all of them did not believe when they were told. So let's stop accusing Thomas of being doubting Thomas. And let's kind of knock that off. All of them believe not for joy. Luke 24, 1 through 4, perplexed. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Why are they so perplexed? Well, as I've already mentioned, this has never, ever happened in the history of mankind. And now look at verse John chapter 20, verses 6 through 9 will help us understand why they are so perplexed, why this is so confusing to them, even though Christ had taught that he would be betrayed and die and resurrected, that it actually happened is now perplexing to them. So John 26 through 9 says, Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. And then went, they, then went in also the other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. That was John. Then nine, for as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise from the dead again, from the dead. So even though they had been taught it and Christ had talked to them and told them what was going to be happen, they knew not the scriptures. I see that as they don't understand the scriptures, and we're going to see in a minute what it means to understand versus just knowing. They don't understand it, that he must rise from the dead. And so that is why they're so perplexed. Luke 24, verse 5, what do we seek? And as they were afraid, this is those who came to the tomb, and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? That was the two angels who said that to the people. I think there's a great principle taught here, brothers and sisters. Why would we ever seek the living Christ in his gospel or the Holy Ghost among dead things? We will never find eternal life among the dead things of this celestial earth. We will not find the living among the celestial entertainment of this world. We will not find the living spirit and what we need for eternal life among the dead 
language of Attila's world, among their dead fashions, among the importance they place upon the pride in their appearance? That's a good question to ask. Why seek ye the living among the dead? Where is my focus? What am I seeking? Do I seek more of the things of a telestial world? Their ideologies, their philosophies, their fashions, their language, their entertainment. I will never find the living spirit that gives life among the dead things of a telestial world. Luke 24, 13-27, the lack of truth can lead to wrong expectations. This is a very important principle that we're going to see here. That if we don't know all the truth, we may have expectations that are unreal, and when they don't happen, we may become offended and think that something went wrong that's not true. But what wasn't true was our lack of truth, and therefore, we conclude the wrong expectations. Starting with verse 13, it says, And behold, two of them went the same day to the village of Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem about three score furlongs. And they walked together all these things, they, and they talked together all these things which had happened. And it came to pass that while they communed together and responded, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden that they knew that they should not know him. In other words, they're not seeing him in his glorified, resurrected state, but just in a natural state as another person. Verse 17, And he, Christ, said unto them, What manner of communications are these? that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad. And the one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and hast thou not known the things which are come to pass in these days? And he said unto them, What things? That was Christ. And they said unto him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all people. Now, I highlighted which was a prophet for a reason. Christ was more than a prophet. He was the Son of God. You see, some of them still hadn't made the connection that this Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of the living God, not just some great prophet. Verse 20, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. 21, but we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. And besides, besides all this, to this is the third day since these things were done. See, they didn't understand the truth. The first coming of Christ was spiritual in nature. He was come to overcome death and sin, to help us against the natural man, and to become spiritually alive. They thought he would come to destroy the Romans so the Romans would no longer harm Israel, and he would redeem Israel physically through battling with them. So you see how not knowing the truth of Christ's first coming compared to his second gave them the wrong expectations. They expected him to overthrow the kingdom of Rome and to reign as king of kings. They had confused the first coming with the second coming, and therefore it led to wrong expectations, and it leaves them wondering what is going on. 22, yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had seen a vision of angels, which said he was alive. 
And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher, and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. Then said he unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. They didn't understand the truth of the prophecies of his first coming that many prophets in the Old Testament prophesied that he would come to redeem Israel spiritually first, not physically to conquer any nations. 26. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Hadn't it been taught that Christ would come to save from sin and death, and that he was to suffer for our pains, our afflictions, our sins, our sorrows. See, they misunderstood and didn't know the truth of the scriptures. 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so he takes the opportunity to show that the prophets have prophesied that his first coming would be to come to redeem them from death and sin. So we too can make the mistake if we don't understand the scriptures, or if we don't know the truth, we could have wrong expectations. And then when things turn out not the way we expect, then we become confused and some may even leave the gospel because of that. Luke 24, 28 to 35, how Christ is made known. And now, this is now continuing, those two on the road to Emmaus. And they drew nigh unto the village where they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, meaning Christ, saying, Abide with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it, and brake it, and gave to him to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? See, now they're finally beginning to hard to understand. It went into their hearts. Didn't our hearts burn within us? That's reminiscent of section 9 of the Doctrine and Covenants, isn't it? When Oliver Cowdy tries to translate and he can't translate because he took no thought but was safe to ask if he could do it. He didn't put in the preparation. 33. And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. This seems to have an allusion to the ordinance of the sacrament. We will come to know Christ through the ordinances and covenants of the gospel if we use them to focus on him. It can't just be something we do on the Sabbath and it's the social thing to do and I just partake of it and I give no thought for what I am doing. Christ will be made known through his ordinances and covenants as we come to understand them in our hearts and become converted. Luke 24, 36 to 45, how to come to understand Scripture. Because you could know a lot of facts about them, but not understand them. Verse 36, and as they thus spake, Jesus stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts rise in your hearts? 39. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. 
Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones, as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy, so there's that repeated again, and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece, of, a piece of boiled fish and of honeycomb. He wanted to show them that he had a physical body of flesh and bones. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. I had taught you about my death, about my resurrection, and redeeming Israel from the natural man. And now this verse, Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. They knew about them, Christ had taught them, but they didn't understand them. Well, what does it mean to understand the scriptures that he opened their understanding? Let's take a look at how other understanding is used in other scripture, and I think we'll get an insight what it means to understand them versus just knowing them. Moroni chapter 10 verses 4 through 5 says, and when you shall receive these things, I would exhort you that you would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And if you shall ask with a sincere heart and with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, I realize this is referring to the Book of Mormon. He says, when you receive these things... But this principle or law applies to anything in the gospel. If we are going to understand scripture, we must ask with a sincere heart, having real intent, having faith in Christ. Faith is doing what Christ wants, when he wants it done, and how he wants it done. See, if I'm asking something about the gospel just out of mere curiosity, he's not going to help me understand and know the truth of it. I need to ask with a sincere heart. If I tell you the truth and you understand the scriptures, are you going to live it? Do you have real intentions in following what I am saying? And do you have faith in me? Will you do what I ask of you? So there is one way in which we understand scripture is that we have a sincere heart, real intent, and faith in Christ. Without those, we will just know the scriptures. We won't come to understand them. They will not become a part of us. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things. So understanding has to do with the Holy Ghost coming to us and revealing the truth. But to get him to do that, I must ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, meaning what you tell me I will live and act upon and having faith in Christ. Look at now Isaiah chapter 44 verse 18 says, They have not known nor understood, for he has shut their eyes that they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot understand. So Isaiah is prophesying about his people in the state of apostasy they're going to be in. And because they didn't know in their hearts, they couldn't understand. Understanding is linked with our heart. Coming to know in our heart, not just intellectually with our mind, but coming into our heart and to be converted. Look at Matthew 13, 15. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I shall heal them. 
So understanding is when the doctrine and principles and the Spirit of the Holy Ghost come to our heart and gives us a witness into our heart. This is far more important than just intellectual knowledge. Therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah said again, He that hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted, and I should heal them. That's in John 12, 39 through 40. So again, the Savior equates understanding comes in from the heart, getting doubt burned out of us in our hearts and getting the truth burned inside of our hearts. Mosiah 2.9 says, And these are the words which he spake and caused to be written, saying, My brethren, all ye that have assembled yourselves together, you that can hear my words which I speak unto you this day, for I have not commanded you to come up here to trifle with the words which I shall speak, but that you should hearken unto me, and open your ears that you may hear, and your hearts that ye may understand and your minds that the mysteries of God may be unfolded to your view. Again, the Savior tells us through King Benjamin that come to understanding Scripture means understanding it with our hearts. That your heart, that ye may understand. We must have open hearts and let the Spirit enter into our hearts. Doctrine and Covenants, section 78, verse 10. Otherwise, Satan seeketh to turn their hearts away from the truth, that they become blinded and understand not the things which are prepared for them. Satan does everything he can to make sure the scriptures, the truth, the doctrine, the principles enter into your heart. Because then you won't understand. And if you don't understand the scriptures, then you cannot follow them properly and return to live with our Father in heaven. We have to open our hearts and that goes back to Moroni, that we must have real intent, faith in Christ, for him to open our hearts and teach it into our hearts. Mosiah 26.3 says, And now because of their unbelief, they could not understand the word of God, and their hearts were hardened. That's why Satan tries so hard to harden our hearts and get us caught up in pride because then we cannot understand the gospel. And if you don't understand the gospel, you cannot live it in the way that we should in order to return to our Father in heaven. We must have soft hearts. And one of the things that the gift of the Holy Ghost is for is to soften our hearts, but we must seek it with real intent. If God reveals something to your heart, will you do what he says? If he knows you're not going to do it, he's not going to reveal it. He will only reveal the things to our heart, knowing that we will then go and act upon those things which he teaches us. So how to come to understand Scripture? Get a soft heart that the Holy Ghost may bear witness in your heart of the truth of all things. John 20, verse 16, Mary told not to touch the Savior. In the Joseph Smith translation of John 20, 17, Joseph Smith changes the word touch to something else, which may give us an idea of why she could not touch him. Joseph Smith translation to John 20, 17 says, 
Jesus saith unto her, Hold me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. So Joseph Smith changes touch me not to hold me not. The Greek word for touch is hapta, haptomai, if I'm saying that right, meaning to fasten oneself to, adhere to, cling to, in not only relationship of friendship, but in a more personal, intimate nature. And so Joseph Smith changing hold me not is a better translation of the Greek word where they said touch. I think, in other words, the type of embrace that Mary wanted at the time was not proper at that time. And so the Savior says, it's not proper right now. The type of embrace that you want, it will come later. I need to go see my Father in heaven. John 21, 15 through 17, and we'll compare that to Luke 22, 31 through 32, which will show the measure of our conversion. How do we know if we're becoming converted? Not just knowing about the gospel, not just having a testimony, which is a knowledge of certain facts, which is important, but to be totally converted and committed. Well, in John 20, verse 15, it said, So when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Joseph, lovest thou me more than these, meaning the fish? He said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He said unto him, Feed my lambs. He said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him a third time, Simon, son of Joseph, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. One of the signs of true conversion is, is that we are willing to go about feeding Christ's sheep. Helping others come unto Christ and feeding them the true doctrine by words and by our actions. Are we feeding God's sheep? Now Luke 22, 31 through 32 says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now we put those two together and we see what will constitute conversion. People who are truly converted to the gospel, committed in their hearts, not just a testimony of facts, but know the truth in their hearts and it has been burned in their hearts by the Holy Ghost. They will feed Christ's sheep and they will strengthen his people. Obedience to the commandments are important. Being truly converted to the Savior and his gospel will not only entail obedience to his laws, but also our level of feeding and strengthening others. Our obedience and service are required to be truly converted. And so, obedience is very important, but also is service to Christ's children. And probably the first place that starts is in the home. For as David O. McKay said, no success can compensate for failure in the home. And so that's how we can tell how our conversion is coming. In any way that is possible do I try to strengthen and feed Christ's children. 
Now in John 21, 18 through 19, Peter's death is prophesied. Elder McConkie said this, Thou shalt follow me, our Lord said to Peter, on that recent day when the chief apostle pledged, I will lay down my life for thy sake. How literally the master then spoke, and how fully Peter is to do as he offered, he now learns. He is to be crucified, a thing which John in this passage assumes to be known to his readers. Peter's arms are to be stretched forth upon the cross. The executioner shall gird him with the loincloth which criminals wear when crucified, and he shall be carried where he would not, that is, to his extinction. So that's what 21, 18 through 19 is referring to, that Peter also will give his life and endure crucifixion. In John 21, 21 through 23, John the Beloved, who we call John the Beloved, his future is prophesied of what will happen to him. Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, Lord, what shall this man do? Referring to John. Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? To thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren that the disciple, that, that that disciple should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die, but if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Well, in Doctrine and Covenants section 7, verses 1 through 4, we get a clarification of what was going to happen to John the Beloved. Verse 1, And the Lord said unto me, John, my beloved, what desirest thou? For if you shall ask what you will, it shall be granted unto you. And I said unto him, Lord, give me power over death, that I may live and bring souls unto thee. Verse 3, And the Lord said unto me, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Because thou desirest this, thou shalt tarry till I come in my glory, and shalt prophesy before nations, kindreds, tongues, and people. And for this cause the Lord said unto Peter, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? For he desired of me that he might bring souls unto me, but thou desirest that thou might speedily come unto me in my kingdom. And so this is in reference to the transfiguration of John, who has not tasted of death and is still on the earth doing the work of Christ in whatever capacity that is until Christ comes again. And so here we see John's future being prophesied, that he is still doing the work of the Father and spreading the gospel, whatever capacity that may be. Well, may we come to learn and understand Scripture, not just know them, that have the Holy Ghost reveal them in our hearts so that we can become truly converted and not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that is out there, that we may stand steadfast in the gospel. In order to do that, a witness of the truth must come to your heart. You must have real intent, faith in Christ, in order to have that come into our hearts. May we seek the Savior to come to understand him and his gospel. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.